It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. Yes, sir, Bob. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. This week, starring reverse engineering instrumental cues. <laughs> yeah, baby, does it get any better than that? And thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. Let me get the chat room open so I can see you, ladies and gents. There you are. Hello, everybody. I see that the crowd is, some of you are on time, some of you will be late. Gee, do I pad for time at the top of the show, or do I start disseminating really critical information right at the top and then have people ask me about the stuff I talked about in the first five minutes anyway? Um, first of all, I do have some notes. Notes. Welcome to today's show. <laughs> And once again, I'd like to thank all of you who joined us at the Road Rally two weekends ago. Man, oh man, was I happy about this year's Road Rally, and I hope that the people who uh, joined us were happy as well. Uh, it was really, really awesome meeting so many of you that I've gotten to know here, uh, gotten to know here in the uh, chat room. Um, on several of the panels in the ballroom, uh, I had Gloria, uh, Gloria Covington sitting behind me, so I got to kind of be with her a little bit. Uh, that was nice. Um, and, and you'll see in an email that's going out tomorrow, uh, I, I just want to apologize. There's so many more people that I wished I had time to hang out with and get to know better. But once the rally gets there, yours truly is just running from place to place all the time. And while the vast majority of my time is spent sitting in the ballroom, um, I generally get like, I don't know, three to five minutes between the end of one panel, tidying up from that one, greeting the panelists for the upcoming panel, uh, maybe helping the staff get water and name cards and chairs and stuff organized on stage. And then I'll run to the men's room, which is, I don't know, maybe 500 to 1,000 feet away, and uh, and then try to get back to the ballroom as fast as I can. And there are always people who are stopping me going, Michael, I've just always wanted to meet you. And I'll say, hi, nice to meet you. I'm so sorry. I've got to go back into the ballroom. But, but I just have a, a question about a submission I made six months ago. I sent in my song, Dirty Water for the XYZ listing. And I'll just look at him and say, I'm so sorry, this is not the time, I can't do it. And I always feel terrible. We actually had one gentleman who I'd known for years that actually refused to um, renew his membership or come to the road rally ever again because he felt that I dissed his wife at the road rally last year or the year before. And I felt terrible about that. I like this guy, I've known him for years. and uh, But man, when it's rally time, uh, I, I'm just, cranking and believe me if I could hang out I would so my apologies to everybody that I didn't get a chance to meet um, let's see what are folks saying in the chat room uh, I didn't get to talk to you Russell after I saw you in the elevator I talked to Russell I got to actually see Russell a lot and he was a really really big help um, Thursday morning getting the database uh, you know all the computers set up and then helping in the grand ballroom uh, I want to give a shout out to um, Neil McTavish and Clark Van Norris. Those guys for years have been setting up the uh, pipe and drape in the back of the room and getting the banners up. And, and that's not easy, man. Those The bases on the pipe and drape are probably, I don't know, like 20 pounds a piece. The pipes are pretty light, but the bases are heavy. It's a lot of work. And those guys do it really, really well. And Russell actually helped them this year and maybe last year as well. So... Uh, Russell says, I got an idea to throw a meet Michael party in May. Why May? But, um, you know, I, I've done that before where years ago, uh, the road rally was actually an idea that came about as a result of me setting up um, pods of members, like 10 members in Chicago, Dallas, New York, um, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Cleveland, I believe. And I went around the country to meet with these member advisory groups and we would actually just like order tons of junk food and hang out either in a hotel meeting room or sometimes a, at a member's house for the weekend and do these day long or two day long brainstorming sessions. And if memory serves correctly, the road rally uh, was something that came from those. So I thank you guys for all that. Um, okay, uh, let's see. I see the word disconnect. I immediately go up to my little meters to see if we're online. Uh, anyway, we should be online. Uh, we've got no red lights on my end. I 
try re, uh, you know, refreshing your browser, folks. Uh, we've, it looks like we're good on this end. Um, anyway, um, I'm really excited about today's show, although I have a funny feeling that it's going to be a, uh, a two-part show because I don't think I'm going to get to everything that I want to get to today. But, uh, you know, for years years you guys know this i've been preaching the gospel of earning income by doing uh instrumental cues um i think it's the fastest and i hate to say the word uh easiest but there's something a little easier about uh creating instrumental cues that are 60 90 or 120 seconds long that don't have a lyric and don't have a lead vocal and they're just easier to create they don't often require a lot of instrumentation unless you're getting into some like big orchestral stuff um and i think a lot of people are like enough lasco you know you've been preaching this for years yeah 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 but i'm a creator i'm a i'm an artiste i, I want to write songs and uh while some people think that creating cues really isn't artful or creative uh, I tend to disagree and uh, as I said on stage at least once at the rally and I believe this is my own little phrase if I'm stealing it from somebody God bless them thanks for the idea but I think I said something to the effect of you can paint houses and portraits they're not mutually exclusive so you know let's let's call instrumental cues the houses let's say the portraits are you know your your tour de force songwriting stuff um, if you're painting houses, you can be a damn good house painter. Um, you can, there's a lot of craft in, involved in painting houses if you do it well. And there's a lot of craft involved in doing instrumental cues. And I just think it's a faster way and an easier way to earn money. Um, so creating what I like to call stupid, and I'm saying this in quotes with much affection, not uh, insinuating that anybody creates that anybody who creates these is stupid, but I like to call them stupid little instrumental cues. They take some thought and some planning, and I know a bunch of our members who really enjoy creating them. Uh, and one of those people is Dean Crepain, and uh, he's done really well for himself doing it. I, I've watched him literally since like his ground zero, and uh, bam, I mean, here we are years later, and I believe that he's doing really well. He certainly has a large catalog and gets his stuff in lots of shows. and. Um, He's written two books, which I'm sure that I featured Demystifying the Q, which is right there, Exhibit A, Demystifying the Q by Dean Crepain. Um, that came out a couple of years ago, I believe. Um, and then this one came out right before the road rally, probably a week or two before the rally. And the funny thing was, it's hard to get that without a reflection. Funny thing was, um, I already knew, I had a, a list of panels that I wanted to do, and I already knew that I wanted Dean to do something, because he is one of my favorite public speakers of all time, and I'm including, you know, like, the big guys. Um, years ago, I was doing a film and TV thing in Nashville, like a, a free taxi seminar, a mini road rally, if you will, and uh, Dean was going to be in Nashville at the time, he goes there pretty frequently, and I asked Dean if he would join me um, for the speaking engagement at uh, the Lowe's on West End. And I don't know, we probably had 300-ish people in the ballroom. And uh, Dean got up there and absolutely smoked the place. I mean, he told the story about, uh, and I'm not going to tell the whole story because I want him to save it for a road rally or something someday. But story about when he was a kid growing up in uh, uh, the Seattle area. And... Um, there was like a, a Tacoma, Washington day, you know, where all the merchants, uh, uh, kind of like a street fair thing, come to downtown, spend your money, eat at the restaurants kind of thing. And he tells this incredibly good story about um, a helicopter dropping ping pong balls. And I'm not going to tell you anymore because I want the story to come out of his mouth because he tells it so well. I was so taken with his delivery, his sincerity, his cadence, is just everything about his public speaking. I was scared to death to get back on the stage. Huh, it's weird. You guys are getting buffering today. Oh, man. I'm so sorry. I mean, it looks fine on my end. Uh, I'm not getting any red lights, and I've got like five bars. 
Um, well, I'll keep going for a couple minutes. If I have to restart, I will, but there's, there's nothing on my end that should be messing this up. Everything is good. All systems are go here in Calabasas, California. Um, Adriana says it's working perfectly for her. Vincent Brennan, yeah, maybe some, maybe it's another one of those uh, um, attacks. Uh, what do they call them? Uh, oh, crud, can't remember. Uh, but you know what I mean, an attack on the internet. I hope not because I am recording the show as a backup. But uh, yeah, some people are getting buffering. Everything is great for other people. Uh, all good in Florida. So maybe it's a regional thing or maybe it's something going on with particular providers. I don't know. Anyway, um, Michael Steimel. Hey, Mike, how are you, buddy? Uh, good to see you, even though briefly at the road rally. Steimel says his is working fine. Refresh your browsers. Um, Dean says he's got two browsers running now. Hopefully that's good. A denial service attack. Thank you. I hope that's not the case. It's the super moon. I went outside last night to see the super moon. It wasn't all that super, frankly. It looked pretty much like any other moon, just full and maybe a little bigger. So anyway, um, Dean wrote these books, and I thought demystifying the cue was excellent. It was excellent. It wasn't just me. I think everybody who got the book thought it was excellent. And then, um, after I had already reached out to him uh, and said, yeah, I want you to do something at the rally, um, and I think I'd probably made some scribbles saying he should do something that's Q related. Um, lo and behold, I found out that he came out with the book, Demystifying the Genre, which uh, is an incredibly powerful book. Everybody should get this. I don't make a penny if you buy this book. You know I never recommend anything that I personally don't feel strongly about. And if I'm making a penny, I would tell you I'm making a penny. So what we're going to do today is this book describes certain genres and Dean very uh, nicely, very generously um, set up links to all these cues so that you can hear them online. So uh, his, during his presentation at the Road Rally, he would play the full cue, but then break it down and play like, you know, maybe just the drum part or the bass and the drums or just the bass or the guitars and did that in order for people, I think, to hear how remarkably simple many of them were are and man his point was made so powerfully and i think people in the audience uh were sitting there thinking damn that's all there is to it now granted there is a range of you know like i said you could do a swampy little acoustic guitar cue that could be one or two instruments you could do a solo piano cue it's nothing more than a little cocktail jazz on a on a piano um, or you could do a full-blown, big, bombastic orchestral hybrid thing that's great for movie trailers. Although we did find out during the course of the road rally, at least one of the music supervisors or music library owners made the point of saying, you know, the days of the big orchestral um, uh, trailer cue are waning. They're not gone, but they're definitely uh, on the way down. And I've noticed uh, ever since then, I've been watching a lot of trailers, um, like I always do, and I've noticed that many of them uh, are, are different. They're not the big orchestral stuff anymore. Maybe it's just a, a few instruments. It's more like um, soundscape um, than it is big orchestral stuff. It's more sound design related, I think. So interesting. Got to stay on top of uh, what's going on in your world so that you're not putting all this effort into creating stuff that libraries may already have a ton of or a style that is just plain not needed anymore. It's fallen out of fashion. So without any further ado, I am going to play some stuff. I, I've marked up this book and tabbed a lot of pages. And as I was going back over it before the big show, I realized that I'm not going to get all the way through all of these today. So there may be a part two coming. But the first one we're going to listen to um, is called Slightly Askew. And don't say anything while it's playing, okay? Hold your thoughts. When it's done, I want everybody to type in the genre you think it is. Now, you guys are smarter than the average bear because you watch the show a lot and you know this stuff. But I'm curious to see how many of you in the chat room 
get the genre right. But wait until I'm done. And in this case, I'm going to play the full cue. So here we go. This is called Slightly Askew. B section. adjusting my air conditioning okay blurt it out I am very curious to see how many of you folks um, will nail the the genre come on Robbie Hancock says ghostly in a way um, there might be a, a genre named ghostly dramedy Broadway show tune Quirky Investigative, Dramedy, LOL, Sneaky Ghost, um, Dramedy, 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 Classical Quirky, Dramedy Children's, Dramedy Gypsy, <laughs> Russell Landwer, really? <laughs> dramedy, all right, Theatrical, Quirky Pizzicato Media, um, Sherlock Holmes drama, Eastern European folk song. Um, hey, Waddy, Waddy JP says hi all. I don't think that's a genre, Waddy. Um, dramedy, dramedy, drama from Rock and Rod, Nassaf. Okay, bottom line is it's a dramedy cue. Now, let's talk about dramedy cues for a minute. Let's see what Dino says. First of all, it's called Slightly Askew. It's a dramedy cue. Um, pizzicato strings. So much dramedy has pizzicato strings in it. Um, so let me, uh, I actually didn't mark up much on this one. Um, Dean says he's also got an underscore mix of the cue, uh, as he does with all of his cues. Um, underscore version is the trick for the underscore version is to mute the melody and run off another mix. So in that case, there'd be no piano or clarinet melody in the underscore version. Many underscores are that simple. Just decide what your main melody is and mute it. Underscores are important because quite often a music supervisor will love your cue and want the, want the cue's vibe, but the melody conflicts with the actor's dialogue. So, uh, okay, there we have dramedy. But there are subversions, um, or subgenres, sorry, of dramedy. And uh, the next cue, which is called Tippy Toad, is another example and this one's called a spooky dramedy cue so let's have a listen to tippy toad Automatically, no, this feels like uh, who's the guy that makes the great stop action movies? Great director. Tim Burton. Yeah. Like right out of a Tim Burton movie. I 
I mean, can't you absolutely hear how that would work in a Tim Burton scene? You know, this is uh, some ghostly character tiptoeing around the pumpkin patch or a graveyard or a neighborhood. I mean, it, to me, it seems so unbelievably obvious. So let's see uh, what Dean talks about. Um, didn't talk about much there. <laughs> um he does get into talking about some panning, but here, uh, here's a list of his panning stuff. Um, am I on the right one? Yeah, I am. This tippy toed. Okay, my standard go to panning of a mix for any popular radio music uh, follows the popular music standard as follows kick, snare, and bass straight up at 12. Um, piano and either organ or other keyboard will mirror each other, one on the left about 10.30 and the other on the right at 1.30. Do the same with guitars, but it'll go a little farther out at 9 and 3. Hi-hats, toms, and crashes usually stay close to 12 o'clock. Uh, if I pan a percussion part farther to one side, I'll try to mirror it with the other side. Now, now remember, this goes back to what I talked about eons ago in the... Uh, the mixing thing I did, showing the landscape using kids' furniture and the mountain range and some bushes in our backyard, that, that I call it the law of reciprocity. That you know, if you've got something over there, you need something over there to balance it. You want to counterbalance it, and the parts don't have to be identical. It could be a, a guitar part doing chunks over there, and I uh, can't really see that chunks on the right and uh, a piano part uh, doing something that's complementary on the left. So they kind of talk to each other and balance out. So, um, uh, I'm looking, it's funny, I, I highlighted so much in this book, but I didn't highlight anything on that one. So I'm moving on because I do see some stuff that I want to get to after we listen to this third cue which is called Hopping Ghost. And let's move on to number three. So here's Hopping Ghost. be hitting the applause for all of these but um so dean says check out the hopping ghost uh the cue hopping ghost hopping ghost is an example of how you take a dramedy track or in this case a spooky dramedy track and give it a little tension a little anxiousness uh, again i'm sticking to a pizzicata viola and cello foundation sometimes i'll double the cello bass part with a fingered uh fender bass to give the track a bit more roundness and bottom uh, the bass instruments give it a pulsing vibe and help to build a slightly uh, a slight anxiety or restlessness, almost a chase scene attitude, if you will. The bells and minor chord structure, minor chords, um, are for the spookiness. And I'm using an acoustic piano, a virtual instrument of an acoustic piano, doubled with a light bell for the melody. So you know they're they're all dramedy, but they're variations on dramedy and. and You've heard me say this a bunch of times on Taxi TV, I'm going to say it again, that if you've got certain patches and you just did a, a straight up dramedy cue, something like sneaking around the windows kind of thing, and now um, if, you, if you're smart and you want to take advantage of the situation, you've already got your patches set up for, you know, pitsy strings and, and uh, whatever else, the bells, etc. Maybe all you need to do is change uh, the chord progression and change the melody and change the tempo, but you've got the basic sounds there, so you've already knocked off probably 30% of your work time 
rather than waiting for a week or 10 days later to go, hmm, think I'll create another uh, Dramedy queue. Oh man, what was that patch that I used? Blah, 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 set it all back up. It's just, yes, it's a little more factory-like, but you want to crank out as many of these as you can in a given year because, um, you know, five years down the road, it's not unrealistic that you could be making five or 10 grand a quarter, okay? Not unrealistic at all, depending on how hard you work, how many you do, and how many of the right cues you're doing. And by right, I mean cues that the industry actually wants. It's one thing to create music that comes from your soul or just pops into your head, the muse drops it in your lap while you're sitting there at your keyboard in your home studio. It's another thing to have like a running list in your head or maybe a list on paper of what people in the industry actually want. Why not create that whenever possible? So uh, at the end of each section, Dean does something which is really cool, which is he does takeaways. And so here are his takeaways for dramedy. Start with pizzicato strings. Makes perfect sense. Pizzicato cello works well as a root fifth bass part. Um, write a major key unless writing spooky music. Makes perfect sense. A uh, one, four, five chord progression works just fine. Uh, I think Dean might have said this. I know I've said it before. When in doubt, you can almost always use a one, four, five progression. It's amazing. And, and you might think, well, that's so stupid. You know, anybody can do that. Well, yeah, but if it works, okay, that's why I call them stupid little instrumental cues. Why not just create what works? One, four, five is a great fallback. Frankly, if you try and make it more complicated, you might be creating a piece of music that could win you Composer of the Year, but won't get used or earn you any income. Um, piano and or clarinet will work well for melody. Write a quirky, playful melody, but simple. Let me underline simple, and I'm going to do that because I'm a fan of simple. Uh, I'm a simple man. And Dino, while on stage, must have said the word simple ten times. Um, Again, it's not about no editor working on an MTV reality show, uh, no library owner, no music supervisor. I never want to say never, but the vast majority of them aren't looking for somebody who's a brilliant composer unless they're doing a you know, $50 million film and they want to hire one of the big guns. Maybe then they're looking for brilliance. More often than not, when they're looking for cues for shows, they're looking for something that immediately works with the scene. And more often than not, it's simple. And you know what else? It's just one thing. Did you notice that all those cues basically are an A section all the way through? Maybe a B section, which is kind of like a bridge um, for four bars or something. But for the most part, they start out simple. Um, probably do, you know, like eight bar chunks and then the next eight bars you introduce another instrument, the next eight bars you introduce another instrument, boom, then you go to four or eight bars for the B section, if there is a B section, don't always have to have one, break it down a little bit, build it back up over the next eight bars, build it up more of the next eight bars, and what do we put on the ending? A non-faded button or stinger ending, bump, bump, right? We know this stuff. Many of you do. Not everybody. Um, and I'm just telling you, this is the way to make money with music. Going back to Dean's list of takeaways. Um, use a long note viola for a counterpoint melody halfway through the cue. Write it in ABA form. Add light percussion if desired. Mid-tempo cues get used a lot. Add your own twist to make it unique. Okay, so all those things considered, let's go back and listen to that one one more time. So this is Hopping Ghost, and it is a spooky dramedy cue. Remember, pizzicato strings, pizzicato cellos work well as the root. Um, right in a major key, unless you're doing spooky. Uh, a one four five progression, uh, the form is ABA, and you'll see it spends a lot more time probably on the A than the B section light percussion if desired, mid-tempo, um, add your own twist to make it unique. Let's listen one more time. Very simple so far. Now it's going to add something.
I'm feeling a B section coming up. I wasn't looking at the map. Back to A. So simple. Get in the picture. That sound, some of you guys are saying you hear an air conditioner. No, I'm using a CD player, so I don't have to suck any uh, computing power out of my computer. I, I don't want to risk, uh, I could have listened to these online, but I didn't want to risk anything that would upset the uh, Ustream Apple cart, as it were. So um, Dean's in the house. So if you guys have any questions about um, about any sort of dramedy cue or these specifically now's a good time to ask them uh and we'll spend like i don't know three or four minutes on that and then move on to another type of cue how's that so let me mark these off on my list all right and now i know where i need to start for the next one any questions for dino Wow, a lot of anonymous people in the uh, chat room tonight. I want to encourage you guys who haven't signed up um, to follow us on Ustream to do so, so that you can get alerts um, from Ustream when the show has started. Uh, ask Dino, yes. Uh, D minor seems, this is from uh, piano, guitar, vocal. Uh, D minor seems to be key for most minor cues. Dean, is that true? A uh, question was always asked, uh, also asked if these cues got signed, and he says all these cues have been used in multiple shows. Um, no, Mojo, the CD's actually playing through the NS10s behind me as always. Um, <laughs> Martin Frog wants to know what music Dean listens to while he's driving. It's anything like me. He probably listens to talk radio because can't listen to music recreationally anymore without dissecting. Um, Dean says it's C minor, D minor, E minor. Doesn't uh, doesn't matter for the key, but it's minor in this ca case. Question: Going to the four or five chord uh, equals the B section. Um, I'm going to let Dean answer that. Dean says, while he's driving, whatever he's working on is what he's listening to. By the way, he made that point many, many times, and I couldn't agree more with him. You know, all you have to do to learn this stuff is listen. It's out there staring you in the face, excuse me, every night on TV. You can hear these cues. Keep a legal pad on your coffee table, on your knee, on the couch, and write down notes. I'm constantly hearing cues that if I were a musician, I'd be writing down, oh, there's this kind of cue, and it's got this kind of instrumentation. The roadmap is staring you in the face. Um, Vicky Flaweth says, I can see that I go too far, too complex in what I do, far too complex in what I do. Vicky, it's probably the single most common mistake, I would say, in people creating cues. Dean made the point several times. He uses really old stuff. He's not, he doesn't have a $50,000 home studio. Uh, everything he does practically is in the box, and he's really masterful at using old software um, and sample libraries that, frankly, are out of date, but he's just good with them. Um, Russell wants to know, Dean, do you ever do dramedy in major keys?
No, Jeff says, yeah, they don't need a symphony. That's true. If they need a symphony, in many cases, that's going to be done by the person scoring it. Um, Dean says he does lots of dramedy in major keys. You know, it's the spooky. Again, remember the first one wasn't spooky. Uh, and the next two were and used minor keys, I believe. Uh, Uh, this is a great question from Vicky. Sorry, I've got something itching my back. Um, and Dean talked about this at the rally. Uh, Dean, how many instruments do you typically use um, in a queue for stuff like this? Not obviously for big, bombastic, orchestral, trailer stuff, but for normal, like, you know, reality show cues. Kind of what's the number of instruments that you might use? Instruments for dramedy, Dean says, four or five, add pads or ear candy. So isn't that amazing? You know, I, you don't need 48 tracks. And Dean also talked about something that he and I agree very much on, which is uh, go mono. For the vast majority of the parts you're laying down, go mono. Uh, it just makes it easier to mix. You have less things fighting each other. It will make things swim less in the overall landscape of your mix. Go mono, bass down the middle, snare drum down the middle, kick drum down the middle, hi-hat down the middle, um, guitar on the left at maybe 10 o'clock, um, a keyboard that's uh, answering it or talking to it, you know, reciprocal on the other side, um, and then maybe some sort of synth pad, and you could be done with a lot of these things. Um, Dean says, some genres demand more, some simply a solo piano or guitar. I can't type. <laughs> That's okay. I can't talk. We make a good team, Dean. Um, one of the most common things we hear from our members that they got used in a TV show is solo cocktail or dinner jazz recordings. Um, and as Dean pointed out during his uh, session at the Road Rally, Anytime that he feels like he doesn't have the chops to play something that's a little more sophisticated than his chops would allow for, sometimes he'll play it slowly and then speed it up. Um, other times he goes back in and, and takes all the MIDI notes and takes each single MIDI note and drags it just a hair forward, just a hair backward to make them feel more human, which I highly recommend if your track feels too stiff and quantized. Um, Charles Watson says, how would you define ear candy in this sense? That's a great question. Uh, let's see if Dino picked up on that one. He hasn't yet, but I bet he will. And maybe he didn't hear me. All right, uh, my personal opinion, unless Dean wants to grab this, is ear candy, oh, there we go. Um, ear candy, pads, hits. So just little things. Think of it as salt and pepper, okay? Bump, that's ear candy. You don't need the bump, but if you put it in there in the right place, just a little thing, makes sense. Um, Dean says, there are other simple things to move it along. So while well, you could have the pitsy strings uh, doing their thing in the second eight bars, um, you add, um, add a pad or bring in um, legato, you know, whole note string parts just to take it to the next level. You know how we always mention in, in the listings about how your cues should have sort of an arc start out quickly get into the meat of things, but start out sparse. Get right into the main melody, the main section. Start out sparse. Next eight bars, add something for interest, like a pad, 
um, that's ear candy. The next eight bars, maybe add a Celeste or something, then break it down. If you go to a B section, um, you know, it's going to be different chords, different melody, and then after four or eight bars of that, go back to the A section, start out with the sparse, bring it back up, bring it to the full on, you know, ensemble, and then close it out with a, a hard ending. Um, Vicky wants to know, Dean, when choosing instruments, do you think about the frequency spectrum? Do you try to cover low, mid, and high in every cue? And Dean says, yes, Vicky, especially with stuff like Omnisphere. Um, too many instances of Omnisphere uh, and frequencies cancel each other out and the cue gets smaller. Um, Mojo says, Vicky, that's a mix and an arrangement thing. And Dean says, Mojo is right. Yeah, we talked about that. Dean talked about that during his presentation. And we've talked about that with Rob Shirelli. We've talked about that with, uh, oh gosh, uh, what's his name? Other uh, engineer mixer guy that was just on the show right before the rally. I'm drawing a blank. Ron and Chris Murphy. So many industry professionals will tell you that the arrangement has so much to do with the overall sound in the mix and the more simple and more well thought out the arrangement is the better your piece is going to sound all right so um let's talk about let's go on to documentary i believe and we're going to listen to track number four which is called Time and Trust. Remember, this is a documentary cue. documentary. simple simple but not boring I need more hands okay, okay so you know what I need I need a sip of Rockstar. Mm. I gotta say, their flavor punched. Tastes like Hawaiian punch, but fizzy. Not too caffeinated either. You don't get wired on those. Okay, so Dean um, gives some little summary uh, bullet points here. Uh, talk when he's creating documentary music. Um, number one, not too major or minor for the key real sounding instruments not too happy not too sad make it move without going off to the races see and, and i pointed that out this thing felt like it had movement but it was a pretty mid-tempo track with not a lot of stuff going on not too anxious not too calm this is like a goldilocks track 
and had an A section and a B section, or he says use an A section and B section. Now, documentary workshop. You can experiment with this little example. Set your digital audio workstation BPM to 120. Okay, so that's all. I'll sit here and wait. You guys can go ahead and set them to 120. Lay down a conga groove in 4 4. Sounds easy enough. Add a shaker, play in eighth notes. Uh, without playing the third of the C root chord, the third is the note E in this case, excuse me, add a, compu uh, a comping guitar, <laughs> excuse me, I'm such a pig, trying to be professional, but I can't, I'm incapable, um, add a comping guitar and electric piano to this progression, and the progression is C, C, F, F, C, C, F, F, G, G, F, F, G, G, F, F, and then repeat. And there you go. Um, lay down a bass that's not too busy. It could simply be half notes on each of the chords root, on each chords root. Um, add a simple acoustic guitar or piano melody, avoiding the note E if possible. Remember, we're trying to avoid making this major or minor. Um, find a soft, subtle, airy synth pad and hold the note down, the note G, throughout the track. Wow, what a concept. <laughs> Just one note. You know, not trying to show uh, the music supervisor or library owner what a friggin' genius you are. We're talking one note throughout the whole track. Either the G above middle C or directly below. You don't want to be too high or low. Um, lastly, take another subtle instrument and add a counterpoint line when you repeat the progression. So the first time you go through, just lay it down. Second time, pick another instrument that's not obnoxious but notable, something where the ear and the brain subconsciously go, oh, there's a little counterpoint. Oh. All right. Um, I, I highlighted don't overthink. Don't overthink. So important. All right, takeaways for documentary. Keep the music's key, not too major, not too minor. Strive for a neutral mood. Mood means so much in these things. And again, you want to stick to one central mood from the top to the bottom. They are not looking for you to score an entire film. They just want 90 seconds, let's say, of mood. Maybe 60 seconds, maybe two and a half minutes. Whatever the length is, and it generally kind of runs in those ranges, is you want the mood to be the same from start to finish. You don't want to create a story with your music because the story is already on screen and they've probably scored the story. They just need a mood for a scene to make one scene, to amplify the mood for a scene. Use real sounding acoustic instruments whenever possible. Don't get too happy or too sad. Um, keep movement in the music without going too fast. Avoid stark genres, he means for the documentary stuff, like thrash metal, urban hip-hop, etc. Have an A section and a B section when possible. Write and play instruments with an emphasis on subtlety. Subtlety. <laughs> I wasn't all that subtle then, was I? Use a relatively sparse melody so as not to conflict with the narrator's dialogue. Wow. Duh. I, I'm, I don't call them stupid little instrumental cues for nothing. You know, it just, it makes sense. So now, um, we're going to move on to, whoops, where did I go? Rough ride, shoot. I think I'm out of sync with my numbers. Um, okay, this one, we're getting into the southern rock stuff now. Um Everybody's repeating, cues need to stick to one mood. Cue, great. It, make it the mantra. Um, that's a good question for Dean. Are the cues in your comfort zone or do you stretch your skills to make it work? I know the answer, but I'm going to let Dean tell you. Um, I do a lot of cues in my comfort zone, probably adding two or three new to me genres every year. <laughs> I'm speechless. Common sense makes great sense. Okay, so now we're moving on to one called Haystack Fever, and this is a southern rock cue. So while this is playing, why don't you make notes as to the instrumentation that you're hearing, okay? And also, if you can, 
write down how many measures you hear and what's going on um, in, in those measures. You know, are you hearing bass, drums, and guitar? Are you hearing a guitar riff? Are you hearing a harmonica, um, an organ? Are you hearing cool little guitar licks that would be classified as ear candy? Um, is there a B section? Make notes. section right it's like a bridge a section strip down ear candy and the licks a little fuller here full band jamming And Russell Landroy has a great question. I'm glad you're here in the chat, Dean. I have a question. I was wondering something. Uh, do you create a 60, a 30 in stingers for every cue, or just when you're going to place them in a library that wants them? Uh, and Dean's answer is I only create a 15, 30, and sec 15, 30, and 60 second versions if the library demands it. And by the way, for those of you who may be new to the world of cues, the stinger is could be just this little ending. I don't know where it's coming. Some libraries will say, give me just a stinger. Bam! And you just edit that little end piece and give them nothing more than that. Sometimes they want a five second piece where you give them the five seconds, obviously starting on the root and the downbeat and then including that ending. But that is what we call a buttoned ending, a stinger ending, a non-faded ending. Um, and just to give you a little education on those, if it were an orchestral piece, I, I personally might call it um, a non-faded ending uh, or a natural ending. Um, if it's a big orchestral thing with synthesizers, it's bigger and bombastic and it's going to be used maybe in a trailer, then I might call it a stinger ending. Um, if it's just a, like a soft rock band and it ends on that downbeat with a little ring out, then I might call it a button ending. But they're all basically the same thing, which is non-faded, just variations on kind of the impact, the arrangement, the instrumentations that are present at the time that all give you that ta-da at the end. Sometimes it could be cocktail jazz and it's nothing more than the root note could be a root chord or you know a chord um, it, it could be the full band it could be a full orchestra all over the place sometimes I personally call it a non-faded ending a buttoned ending a stinger ending uh, there are a couple other things that people call it but I'm right and they're wrong I'm kidding I'm kidding uh, Dean what do you mean by vocal songs like a regular song with lyrics or just background vocals Um, Dean says, Bubbles, yes, regular songs. I'm a songwriter first. Um, yep, he was a songwriter until I took him by the ears and showed him the cue, the world of cues. I taxi showed him the world of cues and look what it's done for the boy. Um, Uh, somebody asked him something, but yeah, the bottom line is uh, Dean just answered a question which we've spoken about before, which is an underscore version usually leaves out the melody. So for instance, on the Southern Rock thing we just heard, you could leave out the, uh, the, the blues harp um, and just have the 
just that on the guitar, bass, and drums. That would be an underscore version. You might leave in the little guitar fills, those are ear candy, or you might take them out. Um, uh, somebody just asked, piano, guitar, vocal, just said, Dean, do you, do you play harmonica on that last cue? Um, Dean says, I like to play real instruments when I can. Dean says, yes, I played real harmonica. By the way, something that Dean talked about that I could not agree more with is you can trick the brain of the listener. You know how they're always saying, I want organic stuff. I don't want to sound too synthy, stiff, or MIDI related. Um, you can create a track that I would say is an A minus. Uh, with a lot of not all that impressive software and the minute that you lay down maybe a real acoustic guitar part you could even put down believe it or not sampled acoustic guitars for like whole notes drums or something but then maybe put down a second acoustic guitar that's played by you a human being into a microphone you would be shocked at how that ramps up the believability and authenticity of that track throw something in there like a real blues harp and whoa check that out um all of a sudden it sounds very very real um fdr 99 says what about drums dean are they usually midi or real to which dean says midi drums i love easy drummer it's rare that you'll hear me endorse something i think easy drummer is the shiz um you know what if you've never used drums Easy Drummer's amazing. Um, the folks at Sonoma Wireworks just came out with uh, Drum Core 4. That one I've heard great stuff about as well, though I've not personally used it. Um, you'd be surprised how intuitive these things are, how relatively easy they are. You don't have to be a computer programmer to learn this stuff. Um, Let's see, question, any quick tips on drum programming? I recently, uh, I got a return recently saying my drum sounded too MIDI. I use Native Instruments Studio Drummer for what it's worth. Um, Dean, what would you do to make drums sound less MIDI? Addicted drums is good. People are saying they use those. I, I've heard great things about that as well. waiting for an answer from Dean, the incredible typist, <laughs> uh, letting us know. Uh, he says, I like Easy Drummer's reverb, just adjust it to fit the genre and play parts a drummer would play. You know, for any instrument, that's something I hear over and over from our most accomplished members who are making the most money, uh, is play parts that like an oboist would actually play on an oboe or a, a trumpet player would actually play in a trumpet. Um, play parts like a real drummer would play. And, and Dean, can you address the issue of uh, sounding contemporary? Like, you know, you could play parts like a real drummer would play, but it sounds like 1979 versus something that is, is very contemporary sounding. And for the folks who get returns quite frequently saying that their music doesn't sound contemporary, could be your melody, uh, could be the drum part, could be the guitar part. There are actually things that make the style that you're playing in sound more contemporary. Robin Frederick uh, gave some great examples in her presentation at the Road Rally. Boy, if you weren't in the room for that one, the, the ballroom was packed for that. Um, so, Dean, what do you do to make your drums sound uh, more legit and maybe more contemporary? How do you how do you figure out what contemporary drum parts sound like versus that 1980 disco? Amanda's in the house. Hey, Amanda, nice to meet you for a brief moment at the Road Rally. Yay, thank you for coming all that way. Uh, Dean says, yes, listen, 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 and play the part that your genre style demands. Uh, Asaf says, Dean, a real drummer can't play hi-hat and ride at the same time. Uh, if you do that on a track, is it okay?
Bob LaGrasso. Hey, Bob. Uh, says, Robin was great. I bought two books. Yeah, she's amazing. That woman put so much research and so much energy and expertise in her presentations. Um, all right. Let's go to the next track, which is called Rough Ride. And this is another uh, southern rock one, I believe. Again, notice the uh, stinger ending. There you have it. So let's do a little recap that Dean wrote in the book uh, for Rough Ride, which is a southern rock cue. He says, uh, record the kick drum in the desired tempo, four on the floor. Duh. Uh, write and record a guitar riff. Minor key, but not too minor sounding. Uh, double the guitar riff. I mean, come on, we're talking a kick drum and a guitar riff that's doubled so far. Add the drum kit. Add the bass. Add an organ and percussion. Again, don't try and win any awards for uh, creativity on the percussion. Feel the groove. Play some of the percussion by hand. Give it a pocket. Add a few guitar sweeteners, just a you know, little licks. Mix and serve. <laughs> How can you not love that? Does it really get any easier than that? I mean, it's, but you know what? I'll bet you that cue has probably been used like a hundred times. That's the kind of thing that makes money. Um, Duck Dynasty. Tell me they wouldn't use that cue. And speaking of which, I know that Dean's got a lot of stuff that's been on Duck Dynasty. Uh, Amanda, you're still here in California? Awesome. Um, this is what sunshine looks like, Amanda. <laughs> But you've got beautiful emerald green rolling hills where you're from. We've got brown kind of dried out hills that occasionally catch fire, sadly. Um, okay, let's move on to a southern swamp cue called Frog Hunt. Um, okay, I'm going to tell you about this one in advance. Uh, it's simple and very short cue using slide acoustic and electric guitars to emulate a dobro. Dean says he doesn't own a dobro. Let's see how well he does at faking us out. Give it a listen. Uh, chart it out, it looks like this. An A section, which is four measures, slide guitar, shaker, and electric guitar doing a pulse. Four measures, add female, ahs. Four measures, add bass, kick, and tambourine. Four measures of a repetition of the bass, kick, and tambourine. Um, four measures, adding a dembe for percussion. Four measures of the same. So we've got 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24 measures. Um, and we're going to listen for the fake dobro and see how Dean did. And am I on the right one? This is number seven, Frog Hunt. Here we go. <laughs>
Okay, pretty darn convincing, right? And now think about this. The title is Frog Hunt. If you are a music, if you're a video editor, and your music supervisor hands you a bin of music or a drive of music to use. And you've got a scene where one of those swampy shows, let, let's use Duck Dynasty again, where they're going out to, uh, sorry for all the frog lovers out there, they're going out at nighttime with the little headlamps on and a light hanging off the side of the boat. And they're going around the banks of a pond or a river and they're gonna gig them some frogs. And they're cruising around and they're looking for those little frog eyes peering out from the reeds. What are you going to hear in the background? I'll tell you what you're going to hear in the background. And right there, they've established a location, right? They've established a vibe, a mood, and a location. And then they're going to bring the music down and that's when the dialogue is going to sit on top of it and this is going to ride in the background am i crazy no you know i'm right is dino right yep <laughs> russell says poor little gig froggies um yeah I, I gotta say as a kid i love frogs I always had tons of frogs as pets um liquid fusion says michael this is a great show thank you um we have dean to thank for much of that um, Dean says he copy and paste some things. Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> Martin J. Frog says, no offense taken, Michael. Yay. <laughs> that was the best comment of the day, I think, right there. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, Dean does what everybody does. If, if you've, you know, if you've got four bars and you know that you want this thing to be 24 bars, paste, 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 paste six times, and there's the basis of your track. Um, Yeah, now we're into talking about frog legs, which I gotta say, tastes like chicken in a very good way. Um, don't let the frog legs jump out of the pan. No, no, let's get off the frog legs. We're gonna hurt somebody's feelings that loves frogs, but they do taste really good. Okay, so how are we doing? We're doing okay on time. Um, so there you have it, Southern Rock and Southern Swamp. Keep your cues led by guitar riffs. Build by adding instruments every four to eight measures. It's the same thing for practically any kind of cue. Stick to stereotypical southern rock instruments and bada bing, you're making money. Yes, you are. Um, he, he has a note here. It says, with, this, with a genre like southern rock, there have been many hit bands throughout the years showing us exactly how to play this kind of music. Because of this, we have a textbook in every song. Uh, a college course in every band and can gain our PhD in Southern Rockology by studying, listening, and reverse engineering every facet of the band's songs. Take the initiative. Commit to figuring it out. Don't be a lazy butt. And then, he didn't say that I added that, and then get into your studio and make something happen. Um, takeaways for Southern Rock. There are multiple genres within Southern Rock. And you'll find that to be true for a lot of genres of cues. Typical Southern Rock moods. Think bar fight, Harleys, tough, rough, truckers. Southern Rock bands, Leonard Skinner, Marshall Tucker Band, 38 Special, uh, ZZ Top, those guys would all fall in that category. Common instrumentation, rock and drums, bass, crunchy guitars, B3 organ, um, Let's see, added instruments for Southern Rock vibe. Dobro, slide guitar, blues harp, banjo. Southern Rock is a guitar riff driven, is guitar riff driven as opposed to traditional melodic structure. It's got an A section and a B section. All right. Um, all right. Got that, got that. I'm looking for my next underline. Um, Here's the thing, uh, Dean has these things in the book called Q-Tips, which I thought was a great name. I'm going to steal that from you, Dino. Q-Tip. I almost always put too much garbage into my music. Too many notes in the melody, too many chords, too many lyrics if it's a vocal piece, too many notes in the bass line, too much ear candy, too many effects, too much of everything. I wish I didn't do this, but it's just the way I'm wired. When I put too much junk in my music, it pretty much always sucks. My work usually starts sounding good when I begin weeding, taking out some of the notes, getting rid of and getting rid of some of the parts, toning down or eliminating some of the effects altogether. 
I call this project process weed and feed. I think it sounds like I smoked some weed there. Um, get the weeds out of the garden and feed the plants with space. Space, give them room to breathe. They'll all be able to soak up the sun and the rain and grow big and beautiful. Soon the entire neighborhood will want to come and gaze upon your Green Thumbs creation, meaning library owners and music supervisors will want to use your music. All right. Um, let's do one more. Um, I just did frog. Okay. Now we're getting into happy, upbeat, and positive, which is a good way to end today's show. Um, breakfast cereal. Think breakfast cereal. It's a brand new day. The sun is, uh, the bright sun is smiling. A parent and their small child wander half awake into the kitchen uh, with bed head, I might, and probably a little body odor or bad breath at the least. Uh, they look like they need to get back into bed, don't we all? Slowly the parent reaches into the fridge, grabs a carton of milk, and pours on a bowl of breakfast cereal. First you see the child look up and smile. And then the parent smiles back. All's well with the world. Can you hear the happy ukulele music strumming over hand claps? Positive. This is just one example of how happy slash positive slash upbeat cues are used in modern media. Boy, you, you can't go wrong with happy, positive, upbeat. Um, you'll see we use the phrase emotionally upbeat so often. There will always be the perfect place for them because you'll always respond emotionally to positive, uplifting music triggers. They make us feel good. I may be oversimplifying by saying this, and this is Dean saying that, but you could probably go into your studio right now and lay down a happy ukulele strum progression, add some claps on two and four, and maybe throw in a kick drum and a note or, and one note piano part to lift the mood. Mix it, pitch it, sign it, and the cue will most likely find a home somewhere in film, TV, or the advertising world. Right? Okay, so let's listen. This one is called Happy Clappy. simple broken down now he's going to build it back up I would bet what about it here section. I mean, really. I love Dean. He's a great guy. Uh, you don't find a more quality person than Dean Crepain. First of all, is he generous for giving that? I mean, he's giving this stuff away. He's showing you how to compete with him. Why is he not worried about that? Because he's built enough, enough trust by acting like a good business person and a talented musician that he's got enough work for himself and it's just growing and it compounds. That's the thing. You know, somebody asked before um, in the chat room how many... Uh, 
cues did he have before he started making money? And he said 800 cues before I started a, a, um, a, a decent living. I don't know what Dean calls a decent living, but I'm going to call, it depends where you live, 50K a year a decent living. Okay, so 800 cues. Let's break out the calculator. So let's say that you do um, a queue a day for 50 weeks a year times six days a week. So that's 300 queues a year. Let's say two thirds of those queues because you've gotten pretty good after about half a year you're doing it. Let's say eventually you're getting like uh, 200 queues a year signed into libraries. So you're looking at a year of learning, let's say, a year where you're probably not going to get a whole lot signed, but you're going to get good. Then the second year, um, 200 cues. If you're, you know, you've earned your stripes and you're getting really productive and you're doing a queue a day, um, and you're getting two thirds of those picked up by various libraries. Um, and, and please, dear God, don't stick them all in one library, okay? Stick them in 10 or 20 different libraries. You want to spread your bets. And not all libraries are good at the same thing. Some people are really good at getting trailer placements. Other people are really good at getting dramatic placements uh, in TV dramas. Other people are really good at getting um, reality TV placements. Some libraries can do a couple of things. But you will find that different libraries, different publishers are good at different things. And they all have ebb and flow. Somebody may be really hot for you one year. And you think, man, I'm going to send everything I make to just those guys. You'll live to regret that decision. You got it's like the stock market. You know, you you buy whatever stock, buy an S&P index fund through Vanguard or something. Stick the money in there, and no matter how high the market goes or how low it goes, just hang in there. Save it for retirement. So now you get 200 cues a year picked up for the next four years. All of a sudden, you've got 800 cues out there in the market, and you're making a decent living, which I'm calling 50 grand a year. So there you go. Um, of course, somebody's saying 800 times $5 entry is $4,000. Uh, you know what? At some point, the libraries are going to know you. They're going to trust you. They're going to add you to their list of people that they reach out to, and you get to bypass taxi. But you got to earn that trust. You've got to deliver on time. You've got to be consistently great. Uh, and you know what? Some people think, oh, I've got a publisher. Oh, I've got three publishers. I don't need taxi anymore. Even people like Dean and some of the other veterans will occasionally still pitch the taxi listings. They still look at them and they pitch to them because they want to add more libraries. There are new libraries popping up all the time. Some of the old ones get stale. Um, some of the new ones are started by music supervisors that are really well connected in their own little world. Um, so you always want to be looking at new avenues. Um, Dean says, finding good libraries, A, submit through taxi, B, ask other members at the road rally. He's right. Um, and somebody asked a question, do you go for exclusive or non-exclusive? And Dean says, both non-exclusive and exclusive. Um, apparently, Liquid Fusion asked a question, uh, and somebody says, not every one of his tracks was submitted through taxi. Once the doors are open with libraries, They'll work with you directly in so many words. Um, all I can say, if I can give Taxi a little pat in the back, in the back of the book, and Dean, seriously, when I saw this, you have no idea how much this meant to me. Um, acknowledgements. Thanks to all my Composer Camp friends. You guys rock. Many thanks to Michael Lasco and the staff at Taxi, Taxi.com uh, for teaching me what a queue is and opening the doors to so many publishers over the years. Also, heartfelt thanks to my wife and family. <laughs> so Taxi made it in there before Dean's wife and kids. Um, how did that go <laughs> that night when this book came out and you sat down for dinner? But I do appreciate Dean. You know that, right? Um, I, I'm thrilled that what we get to do for a living around here is open the eyes for people like you and open the door and the smart ones go, I can do this. And it ain't that friggin hard. It just requires constant, steady work. And it's fun. Painting houses can be fun. Um, okay, a couple more questions before we wrap this puppy up. Um, 
Dean was a kick at the rally. Now, I wouldn't use the word kick because his foot is still injured. I, I think he was upstairs icing that sucker at night. Um, he wasn't kicking anything other than kicking back, maybe. Now, he, Dean's a great guy. Uh, Amanda says, I'm her university. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I couldn't do it without people like Dean and the staff here at Taxi and the, the screeners and the people that are on the panels at the road rally. It takes a village. A um, couple more questions before we call it a day. Look at that, people bugging out a race. So should we do this next week? Should we do a few more next week? And then uh, if Dean can come back, we'll spend a lot more time on Q&A stuff. Does that sound like a good idea? A little delay. For those of you who are watching the archive, there's a little delay between when I ask a question and the answers come up. Uh, meanwhile, while... The delay is happening. Let me show you the covers again of Dean's book. And again, I don't make a penny. Demystifying the Q by Dean Crepain on Amazon. Demystifying the Genre, also by Dean Crepain, also on Amazon. Um, this is very useful. Thanks for a fun rally. Yes, plus one, plus one. Sure, I'll come back. Thank you, Dean. Um, Bubbles, you're not a member of Taxi that love to get into the libraries? Dan, you've been watching this show for how many years? You're not a member yet? Uh, plus one, plus A, yes, sounds good. Liquid Fusion gives it all A pluses. This was my third road rally. Definitely gets better with time. Yeah, and i got to be honest. I felt so damn good about this year's road rally. I don't know how I'm going to beat it next year. It's scaring the you-know-what out of me. Uh, Amanda says the Red Rally is incredible. Thank you. And by the way, for those of you who are in the chat room that were at the rally, please send um, emails to member services at taxi.com. Uh, I, I would love some, they don't have to be 300 words. Actually, I'd prefer it if it's just a paragraph or two. But I do like to take quotable quotes from people who were actually at the Road Rally and use that to, next year. Why every single person who's a member doesn't come to the Road Rally is perplexing to me. We give away so much information. There's so many people that you can network with, collaborate with. Industry pros you can have a beer with. You can go to the mentor lunch. You can do one-to-one -one mentoring. It's just like this smorgasbord of everything you've ever wanted for your whole life in one place at one time. And the icing on the cake is the greatest group of musicians you'd ever want to meet. The people are friendly. They're giving. They're generous. They're smart. Um, Dean says this was his 11th road rally. So here's a guy who um, presumably is making a pretty nice living from doing this stuff. There's probably not a whole lot that he needs to learn at the road rally, but he's there for the 11th time. Treble Tone, fifth road rally. Um, Amanda said, awesome, Amanda. She's going to send an email for somebody who's saved for two years to come to the road rally. When that elevator door popped open, there was Amanda's pretty little face in there. I was like, wow, she made it. Thank you. Uh, Michael, you knocked out of the park with the 20th rally. Thank you. I, I was really proud of it. Worked really hard. And for me, just having people come up to me all weekend saying, this was really better than last year. Thank you. Um, all right, so with that, um, I'm going to sign off. Um, thank you, Dean. Thank you for um, being a friend above everything else. Thank you for being a gentleman. Thank you for writing these books. Thank you for sharing what you know so that other people can live the dream. And like I said at the top of the show, you can paint houses and you can paint portraits. You know, you don't need to um, pick one or the other. Let the painting houses support you while you're busy painting the portraits and doing what you love. And with that, I bid you adieu until next week. Yes, my staff is super. Thank you. Dean's coming back next week. I will see you guys then for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye-bye, you guys. Thanks for coming.